Students, it's good to have you here on my continued discussion of an introduction to the chemistry of life, organic chemistry and biochemistry. Thus far, I've already introduced you to organic chemistry with a little bit of a sprinkling of uh, some of its concepts. Please trust me, they go way deeper than what I've got there. That brings us then to the second half of chapter 24, which is an intro to biochemistry. In my typical hoop de doo fashion, I'd like to begin by sharing something that has nothing to do with anything relevant, and that is a hilarious chemistry cat from quickmeme.com. This one says, I was once frozen to absolute zero, but I'm okay now. Ha <laughs> ha! All right, I also want to share you an interesting molecule of the day. This molecule I can finally show you because I've taught you an intro to organic chemistry. Are you ready? The molecule is ibuprofen. According to this reference, ibuprofen is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, or NSAID, and its structure is shown here, by the way, used for pain relief, fever reduction, and against swelling. Ibuprofen has antiplatelet effect, though relatively mild and somewhat short-lived compared with aspirin or prescription antiplatelet drugs. In general, ibuprofen also acts as a vasoconstrictor. Ibuprofen is produced industrially as a racemate, which is a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers. The compound does contain a chiral center, or a stereocenter, as you can see right here. It's this carbon atom that has a uh, bond to a carbon that's pointed three-dimensionally away from us. There's another hydrogen implied pointing three-dimensionally towards us, and then these two different groups to the right and to the left. So two enantiomers of ibuprofen occur with the potential for different biological effects and metabolism for each enantiomer. S-ibuprofen, which is the structure shown here, was found to be the active form. It was logical then to consider the potential of improving the selectivity and potency of ibuprofen formulations by marketing ibuprofen as a single enantiomer product, as occurs in naproxen, which is another NSAID. Further in vivo testing, however, revealed the existence of an isomerase, that is an enzyme inside our bodies that converts our ibuprofen, this enantiomer right here, to S-ibuprofen, the active enantiomer. So it's interesting that you can actually take this molecule in a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers and we possess an enzyme in our bodies that converts the inactive form, the R form right here, into the S form. So in this particular case, unlike thalidomide that I talked about in an earlier lecture, the inactive form will not harm us. Isn't that cool? All right, so after the next few lectures, which will cover the rest of chapter 24, you guys should be able to define biochemistry and describe the chemical reaction that connects autotrophs to heterotrophs, describe the structures of amino acids and proteins, describe the structures of monosaccharides and carbohydrates, list lipid classes one through three and five and describe their structures, and list the five nucleotide bases and describe the structures of the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. That's the lineup, so let's get started. Beginning with the definition of biochemistry. What is biochemistry? Well, biochemistry is the field that studies the chemistry occurring within living organisms. This often focuses on the interconnectedness between heterotrophs and autotrophs, which I'll now explain. Animals and other organisms that can't make food from sunlight are called heterotrophs, which include us humans. We heterotrophs obtain our energy by eating plants or by eating other animals that have eaten plants that make food from sunlight. Organisms that can use sunlight to make food are called autotrophs. So all the energy needed to sustain life here on Earth ultimately comes from the sun. One of the major energy harvesting reactions that we heterotrophs do in our bodies is this one. Now if you look closely at this reaction, you'll note that it really is essentially just the oxidation or combustion of glucose, C6H12O6, to produce CO2, water, and the energy that we use to sustain all of our activities. In contrast, autotrophs do photosynthesis, which is this reaction. If you compare these two reactions, you'll note that they are indeed more or less opposites of each other or inverses of each other. So the reactant energy that autotrophs use ultimately comes from the sun. So in essence, the O2 or oxygen that we heterotrophs need in order to produce the energy that we need ultimately comes as a product of what autotrophs do right here. And the CO2 and H2O that autotrophs need in order to live ultimately come as a product of what we heterotrophs do. Hence, we heterotrophs couldn't live without autotrophs, and autotrophs couldn't live without us heterotrophs. Isn't that a glorious biochemical dance and balance? I think so. So anyway, there are four classes of molecules that living systems need in order to sustain life, for which I'm going to show a couple of pictorial examples here. Proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. And for the sake of fun, here is a picture of Dr. Evil. 
In the next upcoming videos, I'm going to introduce you to each of these four classes of molecules. That takes us to the end of this video then. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll begin teaching you about amino acids and carbohydrates. Until next time, students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.